This is Inquirer Live. We bring the journalism of the Philadelphia Inquirer to life. We're coming to you live from Xfinity Live. Hey. From the shore to the burbs to Center City in Philly. Always Philly. Inquirer Live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Inquirer Live. I'm Allison McCook, Assistant Opinion Editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, today I'm talking about elder care. Uh, it's basically taking care of older relatives or other people you care about. Uh, this is a topic that I think a lot of people have very a lot of interest in, especially in Pennsylvania. Uh, we are a state that has one of the oldest populations of any state in the country. And that means that most of us will spend at least part of our lives taking care of our parents and other people we care about, or in turn be taken care of by kids, family members, people in our community. Uh, this topic's very personal for me. I am an only child and my mother was diagnosed with ALS, which is a neurological disease, um, around when I was 30. And I spent uh, three years as her primary caregiver. And then soon after she died, my father was diagnosed with dementia and I was his primary caregiver for another 12 years. So it was about 15 years in total of fitting caregiving into my career, uh, starting my own family, all the things you're supposed to do in your 30s. And um, during that time, I had to leave my job for long stretches of time. I, and I couldn't ever work full time because I had to make sure I could take him to appointments and things that he needed. So during that time, I relied on some local resources and I'm joined by two of them today. Alyssa Lewin is a licensed psychologist and marriage and family therapist, and she's been in practice for over 30 years. She founded Nancy's House, a program that's um, located in Cheltenham, designed to break the isolation and exhaustion that can come with taking care of someone who is chronically ill or disabled. The program evolved from Alyssa's own caregiving experience. And uh, while I was uh, taking care of my father, uh, Nancy's house organized a conference that I attended and during which I saw a presentation by Kathy Sikorsky. She's an elder care attorney. She offered some really good advice about what legal documents you need to protect yourselves. Least, uh, Kathy's also the author of Who Moved My Teeth? <laughs> Preparing for Self-Loved Ones and Caregiving and 12 Conversations, How to Talk to Almost Anyone About Long-Term Planning. Uh, before we bring our guests on the screen, I want to remind the audience that you can participate anytime during the discussion. You just submit questions and comments using the comment section below on your screen. Um, and if you're watching on social media, just head over to inquire.com slash live to do so. And now I'd like to welcome Kathy and Alyssa to the screen. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. So happy to be here. This is oh, really yeah. exciting because yeah. I'm I'm already excited that I know we have questions and an, and an interested audience. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say we've already gotten questions ahead of time from people, which I think is a great barometer of for how much interest and need for information people have and resources that people have. And I feel like I, I could talk to you all for like a thousand hours about this. Um, we have roughly 30 minutes. So what I want to do is start by talking about the things people can need legally and like emotionally and physically, things they can do to prepare for taking care of someone in their life or to be taken care of by, you know, their children. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I'd also like to talk just to things, resources and help that we could do to help people who are doing it now. Um, because, you know, both of those are pretty daunting, scary prospects. Um, Okay, so let's start. I know, Kathy, you're, I think as an attorney, you're someone that people come to when they want to get ready. And I remember from your talk at the conference I went to for Nancy's house that um, you talked about the power of power of attorney and how important that was. And are, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Any other things that, uh, any other documents that you think really are essential? Yes, I, I yeah. Uh, I'll do a, a really compact version yeah. of that because we have so much to talk about. Um, so it, it, it's kind of, I, I'd like to just put it pretty simply for most people because the first thing that most people get is a will. They often are very worried about that will. They, they want to get it when their kids are little. Uh, they get them done in their 30s and then they sort of shove it in an underwear drawer and they never look at it again. And they think the will is the most important thing. And a will is an important thing. But when you're talking about caregiving, especially for the elder, 
elderly. There is two much more important documents that you really absolutely must have, an adorable financial power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. Now here's the 30 second definition of a power of attorney. A power of attorney is a document that you sign giving the authority to someone else who is now called your agent to act as if they are you in every possible capacity, either for your financial well-being, your financial services, or your health care. So they're very powerful documents. That person can go get into your bank accounts, your investments, write checks. They can talk to your doctor on the health care side, your, your occupational therapist, your physical therapist, your health insurance company. So these documents as you can imagine, have a lot of authority, but they also are really critical in a crisis, which is always what occurs in elder care and caregiving. And that's why it's so much better to do it now, to do it when you can pre-plan. And so those documents you have to have, and here's the difference between a will and an estate attorney, and those powers of attorney and an elder attorney. Wills and estate conversations are for dead people, and powers of attorney are for live people. That's really the difference. Um, so live people need those powers of attorney. And I'm just going to throw in there that anybody who's 18 years or older should probably have some version of a power of attorney because nobody knows when you can walk out the door, get hit by a bus and need someone to take care of your affairs, whether temporarily or permanently. So you've got to have those documents. Those are really super critical. Get them now, get them yesterday. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my father, his form of dementia prevented him from speaking. So literally, I I still have about four or five copies of, and he's been dead since 2020. I have them still in my possession because everywhere I went, I had that document because I needed to do everything for him. And I needed people to let me do that. Yes. And they won't let you without yeah. it. Yeah. And let me just say without it, then we're talking guardianship, which is a whole legal bag of worms yeah. that nobody wants to get into. Yeah. And practically speaking, do you need an attorney to do this? Or like, can people go to a legal clinic? Or I see online sometimes they're like things that do, do a power of attorney. That's a tough question. I, I, I mean, I'm an elder lawyer. So of course, I'm going to tell you, you should go to an attorney. Of course yeah. I am. And I have to tell you that in Pennsylvania, we are particularly snarky about our powers of attorney. We have very strict rules about what has to be in there, how it has to look, what you want to say about giving certain powers and not giving certain powers. And they are so complicated that if you're talking about someone who has assets, and by assets, I don't mean a millionaire. By assets, I mean a house, maybe a pension, maybe some savings. That person should really go to an attorney. If you're talking about getting one for your 18 year old son because he's going to college and you just want to make sure that the college will talk to you about not only his finances, but his medical condition because he's going to California and you live in Pennsylvania. And I'm not so worried about an online power of attorney. OK, yeah, yeah. but I am going to say, especially in the elder care realm, you've got to have a document art. Generally, elder lawyers documents for powers of attorney are anywhere from seven to 15 pages long. And there's a reason for that. And, and I assume the one you had for your dad was probably like that. And yeah. it covered absolutely every possible thing that could happen so that you would have the authority to take care of that stuff for him. Yeah. And I mean, this is all so hard to do, especially, a, you know, a child talking to their parent about the concept of this role reversal and there may be a time where I need to take care of you and it brings up so many family dynamics and you may have siblings who just, you know, it's just a very difficult conversation to have. So Alyssa, this is a question we got ahead of time actually. Um, and it's something I wanted to ask too. What do you recommend people do to start having these really difficult conversations with their parents? And a lot of people, you know, a lot of older adults may not want to even think about of being incapacitated and needing help. What do you suggest people do to start just opening the door to this? I think there are a few steps that you can take. And first of all, before I even answer that, Allison, I want to thank you for having this conversation with us. I, oh, I, I really you. appreciate that you that you've opened this up. Um, so one thing they can do, and you know, is get Kathy's book of how having twelve conversations that anyone can have. Um, but it, it's also, I think, important to start talking well before you hit any crisis time. Yeah. Um, about 
how things, how do you, how do I, as your adult child, ask you, as my parent, how do you want things to be handled? What is it that would make you most comfortable? You know, we, we know that things change as we get older. What are the pieces that you want to have in place? And it can be scary. So it means it's not a one-time conversation. And I would suggest doing it in bite-sized pieces, you know, just little bits at a time that introduce that idea of I'm not taking over your life. I don't want to run your life. Yeah. I want to know what's important to you so I can make the best decisions. And I know that I hear that a lot from people that their parents either don't want to think about them, you know, needing help, or maybe they are just like you said, like a little worried that their kids want to suddenly run their right. lives for them, or maybe want to take their money or something like that. I I don't know how to, I mean, every family is different and there's no one answer to, to say, do this, right. but I'm wondering what what do you tell people like could it be something like i could go to my fictional mother who's not alive anymore but say like oh when i get older this is what i would like that's what would certainly, you like when you get that's older and that's certainly that's, one way of doing yeah. it <laughs> like yeah you know i think that it's important that you know who you're talking with right um some people um my mother was one of them had this belief of if you talk about it then you're going to make it happen Right. And so everything had to be approached again, bite sized pieces, sort of sideways of what is it that would make you comfortable? What is it that you want me to know? Um, and it might even be things that come up as you watch a movie. It's like, oh, look at what happened in that. How can we, you know, how would you want to do that here? Um, anything that gives you that. You know, when we were raising kids, it was called using the teachable moment, right? Anything that gives you that that doorway into how they're thinking. You know, our parents, if you still have your parents, are of an age where things are happening to their friends. That gives you a doorway into the conversation. Look at how so-and-so's daughter is handling this. Do you want me to do that? What would you like me to do? That's so that it's know. not a threat of I'm taking your money or I'm taking your house. It's more a conversation of how do you want these things handled? What would make you most happy and most comfortable? And Allison, you were right. Using you as an example, mom and dad, I'm going to the lawyer to get these papers done for me. You want to come with me? I think it'd be great. Then you can ask questions. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit and listen and see what I'm going to do. And it, again, as Alyssa just said, it becomes a teachable moment. So you can start taking steps to plan for your future and use that as a guide for your elder. Are there any other things like, I mean, I think power of attorney and the key legal documents and the key questions I think are good. Is there anything else that you would suggest? Like maybe if you have siblings or cousins or neighbors who are involved, like sitting down with them separate from the person you're thinking about ahead of time. So, um, what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. We always talk about, you know, again, raising kids, people talk about it takes a village, but the truth is in elder care, it takes a village also. And you want to have those people that you trust getting looped into the process. And you want to have the people they trust that your parents trust getting looped into the process. So they might still see me even at my age as their kid. And, you know, what do I know? but they might listen to their cousin or, you know, a, a friend who is having a similar situation. So if you can build in that network of support, not only is that important for you now as a caregiver and in building that conversation, but it's also going to be important for you as a caregiver when you're going to need that extra help. That's a really great, that's a really great point. And uh, we, we got, question i mean there's just there's so many questions um, can i ask kathy if you could speak to one other thing though that i think answers allison's question um the five wishes so that yeah that's a that's a, a document that anybody can get online um and it is it is really used as a what you have heard of as a living will or an advanced directive that is the same thing. Those words mean the same thing. Most people get very confused about that. Um, and that document is 
really in the vernacular a pull the plug or not pull the plug document. That's what it means. How do I feel about the fact of what my health care will be if I am in a permanent vegetative state? And there's very specific desires and wishes, you know, about what you want done. That's an awesome document, but not for the reason you think it is in my work. People always say, this is great. You know, I want mom to fill it out or I'm going to fill it out. It's because, and it's as you actually mentioned, if there are siblings, if there are cousins, if there are, I have eight brothers and sisters. And let me tell you something. If my mom, who's 94, and we do TikTok videos together, so that would be fun for your for your readers to go see because she's hilarious. But if one ha something happens to my mom, I'm going to tell you that at least 60 people are going to come out of the woodwork with an opinion about what we should do. Yes. Right? I and that my well. mom signed this paper and said what she wanted to do, whether I want to do it or not. And I just happened to be the person in charge. It's like, we're going to do what mom wanted to do, not what I want to do and not what you other 56 people want to do. That's why I like that paper. And that is a, a very good directive for a crisis situation when people have a hard time making decisions. That's the um, living will advance directive. And the five wishes is also in, under that same thing. And that, that's a really kind, generous thing that I, I forget who put that out, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, and it's online. Anybody can get it. It's a freebie and it's wonderful. Yeah. But it does talk about, okay, sorry, go ahead. Elise. No, I was just going to say, and it does actually, because it's what do you want? What is this wish? It really helps to guide that conversation. It does. And it's it's really the person who maybe can't speak now and, and a family can say, okay, she made it very clear. This mm -hmm. is what she wants. Mm -hmm. And does it, it does, but it doesn't include things like, I think a key question that comes up is when you need help, do you want to be at home or do you want to go somewhere? Yeah. I mean, that's the key to me. That's the key question. And that well, Allison, that's a, that's a conversation though. Right. Yeah. And it changes as, as Alyssa said, you don't do this one time. It changes with time and circumstances and whatever comes through. And those are all the things. And yeah, I, I, I am going to point to my book because in my book, it says these are the kinds of questions you should ask now. Now things have changed. Maybe these are the helping points that you need, like bring in the priest or bring in somebody that they trust because they're not listening to you or their friend did this. Let's go talk to them. Um, and it changes over time. This is a very dynamic situation, as you know, if you've been a caregiver, both Alyssa, you and I have all been caregivers. So we right. know. And every caregiving situation is not the same, even though, it, you know, your mom is not your dad. Very different. Yeah. So you have to be malleable is what I would say. Yeah. I mean, I feel really lucky because, I mean, my father had dementia, but early on he, um, he wanted to tour facilities. So he, he, he went somewhere at a time where he could really choose where he wanted to go. And that gave me just for anyone listening, any, any parent out there or, a, you know, any family member that gave me as his daughter, so much comfort because I knew that he was where he wanted to be. And that, you know, it, that's a real gift. If, it if is. That's where you're right. leaning towards to do that before you really need it was a real gift to me. Um, just putting it out. For anybody. So I'm, I'm looking related to that. I'm looking at one of the questions in the chat, which is, you know, how do you ensure this transition to a different kind of living situation? And I don't know that there is any easy answer to that. You were lucky, Allison, in that your dad kind of took the initiative on that and said, let's see what's out there. I had the opposite situation. My dad had died and it took eight years to convince my mom not to stay in the single home that they were in that was 45 minutes away from me. Um, not that it's about me, um, but you know what? That's about access. I mean, I think geography is an important thing. Like it, it is. is. It is. Yeah. And she, when we had one of these conversations, what she finally said was, "But this is the house Dad and I bought, because we said if one of, when one of us died, the other would be able to stay here." And it kind of clicked for me, and I said to her, "Mom." You were the age I am now when the two of you made that decision. Mm -hmm. You had no idea what this was going to look like. Mm -hmm. 
And the next week we're looking at other places for her to be. She wound up in an apartment um, 10 minutes from my house. Yeah. I, and I just want to interject here because Alyssa said it wasn't about me, which caregivers, we all fall into that, right? That this is not about me, but see, that's the beauty of Nancy's house. And can she just say two seconds about that? Could you please say that? Alyssa. I would love to say that because I was being sort of snarky in the it's well, not of about course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> right? I get it. But you're right. Caregivers, we tend to be invisible in the population at large. We are the backbone of the healthcare system in this country, and yet we are invisible. And we are often invisible to ourselves. And it has to be about us. Um, there's a quote that I love from Audre Lord saying, self-care is not selfish it is self-preservation there are so many quotes you've all heard the one about you know put on your own oxygen mask the one that i prefer is you cannot pour from an empty cup you have to be full in order to be able to give and so nancy's house is really designed to do that we build a community of support we give um, the opportunity to learn to experience some self-care skills we do a little nurturing and pampering um, we have all kinds of things. There was a question earlier in the chat. I didn't yes. see it about support groups. Yes. I facilitate two support groups a month, the fourth Monday evening and fourth Thursday morning of every month. We have a drop in support group. There is no fee. There is no registration. Um, you can go, you can sign up on our website to get our newsletter and there's a place to click to get the link so that you can be part of that Zoom conversation. Or you can reach out to me at Alyssa at nancys-house.org and I will add you to the list to invite you when those are going out. Um, so we have those, we have workshops, we have book clubs, um, we have the conference, Allison, that you talked about, and we have three day and one day retreats. Uh, the retreats require money to run, and so we are always fundraising if you know anybody who wants to donate. Um, but we, we try to really build that community of support for the caregivers and help them understand this has to be about them before it can be about anybody else. Yeah, I will I will echo that. I mean, I my father had dementia, and that can pose some unique um, challenges and needs yes. for me and for him. So I found my group, this is before COVID, I went on the Alzheimer's Association, which is alls.org, I believe. You put in Alzheimer's right. Association in Google and support group. And you you can find, you can put in your zip code, but a lot of them I've checked since COVID are now virtual. So um, I mean, geography doesn't matter as much. And right. that, because another press, pressure as a caregiver that I had, I mean, I was sandwich generation of taking care of my father and I had a, a baby and then a toddler and, and trying to work and all that um, was time. Time was this huge pressure for me. And you're right, when you're taking care of someone, their needs, I mean, my father was like, had this terminal disease and was suffering every day. He really was the focus of everything, you know, rightly so. But at the same time, I was really, you know, as a caregiver and his only child and only resource, it was, it was a lot for me and it felt right. it felt very difficult to is talk about what do I need? And I couldn't even figure out what some people would say self-care. I couldn't even know what that meant. Right. Um, it, Cause I kept thinking, oh, well, I would do things like um, go to physical therapy and get do acupuncture to make sure I would, but then I realized I was doing that to make sure I was well enough for him. It wasn't what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was, go in a room by myself with a book or, you know, binge watch some show and just be left alone. I uh, go to a hotel and turn off my phone. Like that kind of thing was what, and grow away. Which you is know? what our retreats are all about. Yeah. So so talk, talk, turn off your phone, cut that yeah. electronic tether. Right. It was, this, the support group was great for that because it was the only place where people only cared about me and they cared about my dad. Of course, we all cared about who we were taking care of but they were there to help me. And so like right away, I think they told me you're going to, you're visiting too often, <laughs> you know, and things like that, that felt so selfish to think about, but so, it, you know, my dad didn't notice when I cut back on my visits, right. but I did, you know, it really improved my quality of life immeasurably. So I really echo the support group. And um, is there anything else that someone like, you know, 
my neighbor, I see her drive up, take care of her mom every day to change her bandages. And mm -hmm. I just think about her every single day. And it's been years she's been doing that. Is there anything else that caregivers can do and people, you know, the children of aging parents can do now um, to take care of themselves, to prepare for this, especially so, if they've had this, this time pressure, so little time. So talking about your, your neighbor who drives up and changes his bandages, um, it is really important. If other services are available, use them. You don't have to be the one. Even if your parent is telling you, you have to be the one, yeah. you don't have to be the one, right? If there, there are dental services that come to your home, there are um, podiatrists that come to your home, there are medical services that come to your home. Um, all of those are available and use them use them. Those are so important. Anything that you can do, because there's so much we have to do as caregivers. Can I just slip in a couple of ugly statistics here? Sure. Um, because I think people don't realize that being a caregiver does take this huge toll. A uh, statistic I found not long ago on agingcare.com, 30% of caregivers die before the person they're taking care of. Yeah. 30%. I've seen that happen, actually. A few right. times, like in real time. Yeah. Um, there was a study that was done a while back, women my age taking care of an ill husband, an ill spouse, and, and feeling the burden of that. 63% increased risk of premature death. Okay. And then we have increased rates of depression. 40 to 75% of caregivers have depression. We have increased rates of diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, all kinds of, right? So just all of that is to say taking care of yourself is so, so, so important as you are taking care of your loved one. And start building that in now. Start building those conversations in now. I want to come back. Um, there was another question also about the home care. I just want to say, so we had to place my mother-in-law in nursing care. Um, my mom got to stay in her apartment which was 10 minutes away. So I provided support care to her. My father-in-law lived with us for his final five years. I've done, I think, every version of yeah. how, how do you take care of someone? And I just want to emphasize there is no one answer. There is no one size fits all. You really have to gauge who you're working with and what they need. Yeah. And my mother was, my mother stayed at home because I knew she would never want to go to a facility and my father wanted to go somewhere. So I can see that exactly. And that's what worked best for them and for me. Um, and I think taking care of yourself also, one thing that I did too during this that was really helpful if people have the opportunity and uh, resources is therapy. And I just found someone through my insurance. I was lucky enough to have that. And because I think it's very a very emotional experience taking care of your parents. It brings up all the family dynamics and it was just me and my dad if you have siblings coming in and you know your out of town brother who shows up and is like mom's fine what are you talking about i'm not paying for this you know like that it brings up all those old wounds and bad patterns and it's all times a million you know while you're doing this so that was very helpful for me too that's the, really the other thing i'd like to add to that is these legal documents that we talked about, you often have a legal benefit at work. You can use this to get those documents. People think it's for, you know, drunk driving or whatever. Go to your legal, if you have a legal benefit at work, you can use this to get probably a discount for you and probably even your family members. Because I haven't met a lawyer yet who's like, no, don't bring your family. I'm not going to give them a, a discount on documents. They want your family members. So that's one thing. But also mental health benefits at work. If you're a caregiver, Note that those mental health benefits are there for you. And it doesn't mean you have to be in a crisis situation. You can just be in a I'm tired situation and I don't know how to deal with this. There are often benefits at work. And since so many of our caregivers are, you know, they say there's 53 million unpaid caregivers, but they're not unpaid people. They're working. They're paid people at some other job. And so often these benefits are overlooked as something a caregiver can use to help them get through this tough, tough time. And Kathy, I'm wondering, we've gotten a few questions about Medicaid, which yes. I think is really important, um, the paying for all of this. I mean, we could talk for a thousand hours just about how difficult it is to pay for this. Yes. Uh, all the sort of help that you can get that 
people don't have time to look for, but is yes. available. Can yes. you talk about some of the things like we got a question about Medicaid asset protection yes. trust and things yes. like that. I know it's very complicated and we can't get into this, but are there some things you could say? Well, the first thing I want people to understand, because this is a big misunderstanding, especially for people who are taking care of their parents, Medicare does not pay for long-term care supports and services. It's not going to pay for a nursing home. In Pennsylvania, it's not even going to pay for assisted living. It does in some states, but not in Pennsylvania. And so basically what that means is, is you are on the hook to pay that bill. However, your parents' assets can pay for it. And so, yes, someone did mention in the questions about the, the spending down of assets. You are expected to spend your money down to either $8,000 or $2,000 in order for you to then be eligible for Medicaid, which will pick up a nursing home bill. That's the spend down part. And it can be extraordinarily painful. And if your parents are a healthy person and an ill person, you really want to protect the healthy person. Because if your mom is healthy and your dad is sick and he goes into a nursing home situation, how are you going to pay all of their assets for his care and not have any money for your mom? Now, you're allowed to keep some money. But it's usually not really felt like it's enough. It's something like 147000 I think, is the current amount that you're allowed to keep, period. And then a monthly amount, which is also determined by a math formula. And that's, Between, that's to set aside for your healthy parent, is what you're saying. Right, exactly. That's for your healthy parent. And then everything else has to go to your sick parent. And you can keep your house and you can keep your car. And there's there's lots and lots and lots of complicated rules around this. Which So I highly recommend that you go see an elder attorney about this situation if you see that you're heading in that direction. Because there are ways to protect assets. We have figured out ways to protect more assets and better assets, especially for a healthy parent. Sometimes even for a legacy, depending on what kind of assets your family might have. But you can't do this without help for people who do this all the time as a complicated legal process, okay? And I just want to quick address just a quick question here about why do hospitals and nursing homes not recognize the authority of a power of attorney? That better not be happening. Yeah, it specifically says in the law that they cannot do that. Financial institutions can't do it and medical institutions can't do it. So if you've had an attorney draw that up for you, you have to let them go to bat for you because that's completely out of line and they are not allowed to do that. Yeah. Okay. And then we have some questions about long-term care insurance. I will say in this case, I was very, very lucky. My parents got long-term care insurance very early nice. in their life. So I used it. I used it for my mother and for my father, and it saved us. I mean, it was exorbitantly awesome. expensive, but it saved us a lot of money. And I know that that's, I've, I'm understanding that the, the marketplace has changed a lot. It has. It's, it's changed very time. dramatically. And yeah. FYI, I don't sell anything. I don't sell insurance or financial products. I just know this because I work with my clients around this. Um, but, and, and that is often the, you know, the, 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 conversations oh it's expensive but when you look at the actual cost of care it's probably not that expensive you know compared to the cost of care and who are you trying to preserve assets for if you have a 66 year old healthy mom and your dad is really you know deteriorating very quickly she's got a long life ahead of her that long-term care insurance policy that they may be thinking about buying if he was healthy at the time is gonna protect a lot of assets for your mom. So you have to look at who you are as a family. The cost can seem exorbitant, but there's lots of different products in the marketplace, lots. The, the, the marketplace is now coming to us because this is only getting to be a bigger problem, not a smaller problem. It's not going away. The cost no. of care is not going away. Mm -hmm. And so many a financial advisor and an insurance advisor, um, and they should work with your attorney, work together, work to have your financial advisor, accountant, all work together to make sure you're getting the proper thing for your expenses and costs and what you want to cover. But I am an advocate of long-term care insurance. I'm sure you are, Allison, based on your experience, if you can fit that pr appropriately in your budget. I mean, I know it is It is really, I'm, it, this is something that even just, I think the monthly premiums put it out of reach for a lot of people. Does it does. It, it does. Just because. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a it shame. Does. 
But really, when they get hit with an eight, ten, twelve thousand dollar nursing home bill each month, that's what it is a month. A month. Yeah. That doesn't change regardless of the cost of your long term care insurance, which might be five thousand dollars a year, right? So you just have to be honest about what you're looking at and what you think you're trying to accomplish. And that's why I recommend that this is a team effort. You need to talk to your financial advisor, your accountant, your attorney. If you have those people and you have those kinds of assets, you need to be having this conversation. And is there any kind of um, like I know we have legal clinics and things like that for people who can't afford, you know, a, mm -hmm. An esquire firm, you know, a private law firm. Do they have any equivalent of that for elder care and elder, like people who can just, you know, community advisors who can help you with this? I mean, we Pennsylvania has the Senior Law Project, which is very, which is actually free, and there may be a sliding scale, but as far as I know, last I, I heard, it was actually free. So that's out of Philadelphia, I believe, but it's for the entire state of Pennsylvania, and it's it's benefits and advice and and uh, I think document prep. It's called the Senior Law Project. So check that out for sure. That's a great, that's a great thing to know because I do. Yeah. I feel like there's the sometimes the less resources you have, the more help you need, you know, like, the, and, and so it's, it's just this, yeah, I hate seeing all the haves and have nots and just around this issue. Yes. Um, yes. And I will say long-term care insurance is not an automatic guarantee that everything's right. fine. Like in both my mother's case and my father's case, I had to fight denials of claims. Um, True story. In, in one case we had to get a lawyer involved Right. And it was just some, and it was a good company. Like it was a totally, it wasn't, you know, it was a very good company that once they started paying, it was great, but it was just these little fine print, you know, that they mm -hmm. used to reject a claim initially. And it was, I just hate this, this, the fact that, you know, when you need help is when you most need to fight for it kind of. Yes. Uh, situation that we have, but that's yes. unfortunately the way it is here at least in this country that you know. yes right <laughs> um okay uh i honestly could talk to you guys for <laughs> forever is there any aspect of this that you really want to make sure we address that we haven't talked about because we are nearing the end of our time we've been going over a little bit so now I, I think one thing that's important that i want people to know is as Kathy said earlier, and Allison, I think you said also, family dynamics play into this. Um, it is not uncommon to have that squabbling between siblings about who, who knows the right answer. Um, I think it becomes really important to, as a caregiver, as a primary caregiver, um, it is important to have faith in yourself and be confident in your decisions because everybody's going to have another opinion and you need to know that you are making the best choice that you can make and, and to hold that as your guidepost. So. And I am going to tell everyone in this room, please, please, please go get your documents. However you can do that. Even if you find it the most inexpensive way, anything is better than nothing and start to make a plan whether that just means one conversation, a little conversation, but you know, no plan is also a plan and no plan gets a lot of people in trouble. No plan gets a lot of people in a crisis where anger flares up, bad, you know, bad feelings flare up. Just start to talk about this in a way that you can do it and get those documents. You have to have them. The time to make decisions is before there is a crisis. Yeah. Crisis always. decisions are hardly ever good ones. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I remember too. Some people in my support group, we would talk about um, visiting facilities before you need, and this is, you know, on behalf of someone you were taking care of mm -hmm. before they needed to get there, so that you had the list of your top one or two or three, and th so that if the crisis, you know, they have to move now, you can make a call. And you know, you don't have to do the touring then when you're in a panic and just we'll take whoever will take you. If you've got, you're on a list or whatever already, then you just, when the crisis hits, you can just make the transition really smoothly. So that was, you know, I, I totally, planning ahead is really hard. It's hard to think about all this stuff. It's hard to about, think about people you love dying and being sick and suffering. Like 
No one wants to think about that. But unfortunately, it will happen. And, you know, if you think a little bit ahead of time, it makes the whole thing easier for everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one piece just to tag on to that from our, our video, one of our guests said, you know, it's almost taboo to live while someone else is dying. Mm -hmm. And really, our focus has to be how do you live your healthiest life while you're taking care of this person? Uh, that's so well said. And thank you both so much for joining us for this really essential conversation, I think. Um, and for all, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, it's so valuable. I, I really benefited so much personally from it. And I know so many other people who have too. And I always say you're either going to be a caregiver or someone who gets taken care of. And it's just a topic that everyone needs to pay attention to. I uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation. And for more information on our upcoming interviews, head over to inquire.com slash live for the full listing. I'm your host, Allison McCook, Assistant Opinion Editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and um, have a great evening. Thanks, Allison. Thank, Thank you, Allison. You.